Welcome to Wireless Land Weekly, a podcast focused on the wireless networking professional. We aim to educate, inform, entertain, and inspire. Get ready to listen and enjoy. Now to our host of the show, Keith Parsons. Keith Parsons here, back with you with episode number 13 of Wireless Land Weekly. In today's episode, we're going to first start out with Kevin Sandlin. Kevin's the CEO of the CWNP program, and he's going to make some announcements for us for the calendar year 2010 that has respect to CWNP, followed up by a second technical segment. And this time we have brought back Jennifer Huber with us, and this time we'll be talking about the real-time location tracking systems. And we're glad to have both of them on the show today. So now, on with the show. Today's wireless networking definition from the CWNP Dictionary of Wireless Terms and Acronyms. Polarization, the physical orientation of an antenna, typically vertical or horizontal, but there are some antennas that have circular polarization as well. An antenna will generate an electromagnetic wave that varies in time as it travels through space. If a wave traveling outward varies up and down in time with the electric field, always in one plane, that wave, or the antenna, is said to be linearly polarized. It's vertically polarized since the variation is up and down rather than side to side. Linear polarization also includes the possibility of the electromagnetic waves traveling right to left or horizontally. As a special case, if that wave sends in a circular path, the wave or the antenna is circularly polarized. This implies that certain antennas are sensitive to particular types of electromagnetic waves. The practical implication of this concept is that antennas with the same polarization provide the best transmission or reception path. Rant, pet peeve, what really bugs you? 60 seconds of complaining starts now. Hi, this is John Freeman with Xeris. One of the things that really bugs me is when people take for granted the capacity that they might require inside of their business. They have plenty of capacity when they're at home with their single access point and generally one or two users. And then they get into their office environment where there's going to be 20, 30, 40 people and place one access point in an area that's going to service that number of people and don't realize the pain it's going to cause those users, their expectation coming from home, just like their expectation being they'll have a fast connection. But without additional radios, they simply can't deliver that to their users. So many people leave that out of the requirements and don't consider what they're budgeting for. Things every wireless LAN professional needs to know. Gear up, buckle down, and stand by for the real techie stuff. Hello again, this is Keith Parsons with Wireless LAN Weekly, and today we've got Kevin Sandlin. Kevin Sandlin is the CEO of the CWNP program. Kevin's been around since the very beginning when it started up years ago, and because of the CWNP program, we have very, you know, hundreds now, if not thousands, and we'll probably hear from him, of people who have been certified in wireless networks in a vendor-neutral certification. So uh, big kudos there to Kevin and his team with the CWMP program. And today he'll be talking with us about the CWMP program in 2010. Kevin's coming to us from Atlanta, Georgia, and we're glad to have him on the show today. Kevin, how are you doing? I'm doing well, Keith. Thank you very much. I appreciate the opportunity. Glad you could come join with us. Uh, our audience is full of people who have been uh, following along with the program, getting certified from you know the original CWNA to all the programs we have now, and we're looking forward to hearing uh, what you've got to tell us about the plans for uh, 2010. Very good. Well, I do have a slew of announcements, uh, some of which have already been made on our website and through our, our email newsletter, but um, we can always uh, make uh, make people more aware of the details of everything that we're announcing. So I'm just going to basically go down and make a rundown of the, the current things that, that are out on the website uh, already and have been since since late February and early March. And, and then I've got a few new announcements. I will uh, touch on one point, Keith, that you mentioned. Uh, we do have uh, thousands of folks out there who are CWA and CWSP certified and uh, pushing 100 on CWNE, which is, is quite a bit of progress. So we also uh, have 100 people certified in uh, well over 130 countries. So um, we're well spread out across the globe. As far as CWNP in 2010 goes, uh, first of all, I want to say good riddance to 2009. 
Um, I hope everyone else says that as well. It was a, it was a, not a fun year, a very challenging year that we learned from quite a bit. Um, but it's all pretty much uh, a shakeup of our organization. So we'll talk a little bit about that. The first thing that uh, I'm sure everyone knows because it was well announced last year is that our, my other co-founder, um, I was one of the co-founders, the other co-founder of CWP was Devin Aiken. And he's now um, working even more hours, if that's possible, at Aerohype. So congratulations to Devin. And uh, before Devin left, he trained up a young man named Marcus Burton, who is our new Devin. And Marcus is really knocking it out of the park with uh, his writing, his, uh, his content that he's creating for our classes, for our practice test, and for our exams. So uh, kudos to Devin for training Marcus. Kudos to, to Marcus for really stepping up to the plate. Second, uh, if you were anywhere near CWNP.com in, in late February, uh, it probably wasn't very fun. We were transitioning to our new website, which we fully admit that the, uh, the transition to that website did not go very well. But we've uh, gotten through all the, the lumps and bumps there and got a lot of free stuff and dynamic content out there. Uh, to name a few, we have our, our question of the day, which now appears on, uh, on the homepage every morning and is also pushed out to, uh, to Twitter in case you follow us there at twitter.com slash CWNP. Uh, we also have a term of a day, which is uh, directly from our CWNP dictionary. It'll take us a few years to get through all of those terms. So you probably uh, want to pick up a copy of that dictionary if you don't already have one. It's just 20 bucks at the website. So that term of the day is uh, pushed out there every day, uh, also um, via Twitter. We also uh, changed one of our the offerings that we had begun offering last year was uh, the 802.11n video, which was scripted by Devin Aiken, and it's actually – our uh, most of the um, of the CWNA class that covers um, the 802.11 in the subject that's all in one video, um, and we were selling it for about 150 dollars last year, I believe. And now we're giving it away for free. Uh, we wanted to reward all of our customers uh, who, uh, who are so loyal to us, and uh, we found that to be a very very valuable giveaway uh, to get people's attention. So it's free with any purchase. All you have to do is either make a purchase or uh, join our newsletter, and we're glad to send you a license to that video. It's online. You can watch it as many times as you want. And uh, more free content that we put out there is all of our white papers that uh, from Devin Aiken's famous uh, um, chicken and egg white paper to the latest one by Marcus Burton on arbitration. And um, we also have the original CWAP study guide is out there as a free downloadable PDF. Uh, again, all you have to do is create an account, log in, and you can pull these documents um, straight off the website. We have started pushing some tools out, um, vendor-related tools, or, or actually tools to, to help uh, uh, Wi-Fi engineers do their jobs. And we're going to be adding more to that soon because what we discovered, and Keith, you probably noticed this too, too there are a lot of, of the Wi-Fi vendors uh, pushing free software tools out there. And so um, we're going to be creating a uh, kind of an aggregation of all of those and uh, just making it available to our audience. I'm sure there's another way you could find them, but we thought it would be a good service to our audience to push it out there. So those are the things that are out there, uh, just to name a few, um, on our new website. Uh, we hope you like it. If, uh, if you find a problem or see anything that, you, uh, that isn't clear to you, please send us an email. We'll be more than happy to fix it up. Uh, brand new for 2010 is the new CWSP exam and study guide and practice test and uh, coming uh, very soon in, in early May will be the new CWSP course. So uh, starting with the exam, because that's the uh, where the rubber meets the road, so to speak, um, PW0200 is the current CWSP exam. It's been in place since uh, 2008 or late 2007, and that exam will go away on April 30th of 2010. So that's just a little over, a little under six weeks away now. And it is being replaced with uh, exam number PW0204. That exam is currently available, so we've got a little bit of overlap. You can take either exam right now uh, towards your CWSP certification. But keep in mind that the uh, original or the current CWSP exam, PW0200, goes away after April 30th. And because it's re being retired, we're kind of celebrating its life, and you can get uh, a voucher for that exam for $100 off. Uh, just come to our website and go to cwp.com slash cwsp, and you'll be right there. So uh, that's the exam. And then um, even more exciting than the exam to some people is the book. Um, David Coleman, David Westcott, Sean Jackman, and Brian Harkins have put together a wonderful 
um, wireless security book uh, called the CWSP Study Guide, and Cybex has published that as they publish all of our books. Uh, that book was released in early February, and it's available on our website now. Um, and again, when you purchase that or anything else, you get the video, the, the 802.11n video for free. So it's out there. It's ready to go. It's uh, about 670 pages of Wi-Fi security bliss. So uh, good reading there and a, a fine resource as well as a great way to prepare for the CWSP exam. So uh, a couple other new things, Keith. Um, you may have uh, hopefully have already received your new CWNE identification card. Uh, and you'll see on there a cool new logo. Um, I, I did get the fly. card. I got the card. It's sitting right here in front of me. Excellent. Hope you like it. Uh, it is simplified, but uh, also more to bring out uh, that CWNP, uh, CWNE logo. And uh, that logo is a sign of things to come, both uh, for CWNE and for other logos. That's just a little hint um, that uh, each of our other certifications will be getting a refreshed rebranded logo that uh, takes on some of the same elements as the CWNE logo, um, but uses a different, uh, you'll be able to tell a, a sharp contrast between them. So that's coming for everybody who is CWTS, CWNA, CWSP. But also there are more changes to come, which you've just announced for CWNE, and that is that the, uh, the CWNE exam, PW0300, is going away. It will be going away effective September 30th, 2010. So you have until then to take it. And uh, taking its place will be two other exams. That would be the CWAP exam. If you're around a couple of years ago, you know that that has been resurrected. And the CWDP exam. So I'm going to talk very briefly about each of those and then uh, how that wraps up into uh, CWNE. So uh, currently... For, to earn your CWNE, you have to pass uh, the CWA exam, the CWSP exam, and the CWNE exam. And then you have to fill out a pretty rigorous application and meet some, uh, some stiff requirements. So that's what it is today, and that's how it will remain until September 30th. As of September 30th, uh, that will all change. And the new rules for earning your CWNE will be that you have to pass um, the, the CWNA exam, the CWSP exam, the CWAP exam, and then the CWDP exam, and then uh, also complete the application. The application is going to change uh, a little bit. Uh, we hope to, to simplify it. That doesn't mean make it easier. It just means make it um, a little clearer. So uh, you have to pass those four exams and then um, complete the application for CWNE. Again, that takes effect September 30th of 2010. Okay, so make it October 1st, 2010 is when the new effect, new rules go into effect. So um, we a little bit about the uh, AP and DP exams. The CWAP, again, if you've been uh, following CWNP for a while, you'll know that we had that certification um, in, back in 2004, and we rolled all of that content up into, into CWNE in 2007 mainly because uh, the content, while it, while it was very relevant, there was also uh, not a huge market back in 2004 for 802.11 analysis. And that market has gotten very strong with uh, the various uh, tools that are out there from Air Magnet and, and Wild Packets and Air Defense and, and uh, several others who make fine products for troubleshooting and analyzing the, the 802.11 packet and frame. Um, so we have heard from our audience over the past couple of years that, that now is the time for CWAP, and, uh, and so we pulled the trigger now. So um, Cybex has again signed on to deliver uh, the CWAP study guide, and I believe I'm speaking with one of the authors of that CWAP study guide. Isn't that a correct statement, Keith? That is correct. Uh, with I'm doing that along with David Coleman and David Westcott are doing the CWAP study guide. Just got Very started good. in it. Excellent. Uh, it's going to be a wonderful book uh, with uh, three authors that are uh, extraordinarily capable of delivering uh, exactly the information that anybody will need to know how to best troubleshoot and analyze uh, any wireless network. Yeah, I think we should have a tagline on that book and says, we put the anal in analysis. <laughs> uh, we'll see if we can sell that to side. That. That sounds like <laughs> I don't think idea. it'll go over. They probably won't, but we can certainly put that on a, a couple of blog posts when the book comes out. I think it feels that way as we're getting deep, deep into the packet structure. 
it is a deep, deep, very, very anal book that's gonna it's gonna make pe- most people uh, hurt their brains. But uh, it's best. It's good for the industry and it's good for everybody to know how to go about using these tools because they're very, very valuable tools. And really, it's all the stuff that's been in the CWE all along. So I'm I'm glad to hear this announcement. There's the CWE was such a huge monster exam. Splitting it up is a, is a good idea. So oh, good. So continue on with your CWE AP and DP. Very good. Uh, so CWE AP again, certified wireless analysis professional. And as Keith said, we'll put the anal in analysis, and uh, that exam will be along in um, in probably late September. Uh, so there'll be a little bit of overlap there, but it'll certainly be available uh, October 1st. And um, we expect the uh, the CWAP study guide from Cybex. Cybex, and as Keith said, with uh, with himself and David Coleman and David Westcott authoring that book, will be available towards the end of uh, of this year, end of 2010. Um, so that will be uh, resurrected, as it were. And then uh, the other new certification we're going to be creating is the CWDP. Certified Wireless Design Professional, and we have uh, uh, another incredible cast working on that uh, book, including um, Sean Jackman and our own uh, Marcus Burton. And uh, they, Sean was one of the authors on the, the current CWSP uh, study guide, so um, he's, he's well aware, well informed on the process, and, uh, and an excellent resource there. So same type of process. That uh, exam will be available in late 2010, as will the study guide. And um, the requirements for each of those will be very much similar to the, uh, the requirements to earn your CWSP certification. So if you're, if you're thinking in a, in a uh, certification pyramid, if you will, as you start at the bottom, we have CWTS, and that is a, a very broad uh, entry-level certification for uh, project managers, salespeople, and tech support. Above that is CWNA. And then above CWNA will be the three professional certs, uh, CWSP, CWAP, and CWDP. And then sitting at the very pinnacle, as usual, is CWA. So if you want to earn your CWAP certification, then you have to pass two exams, PW0104 and then the CWAP exam. We haven't numbered that yet, but we will be doing that shortly. Similarly, if you want to earn your CWDP certification, you have to pass two exams, the CWNA exam, which is PW0104, and then the CWDP exam. And again, to reiterate, when you want to earn your CWNE, you pass CWNA, CWSP, CWAP, and CWDP, and then complete the application, and you have your CWNE and your wonderful new CWNE ID card. So I hope that's clear. It is all very well enumerated on our website and uh, under uh, the CWNE certification tab, as well as we'll be, we just pushed out the uh, the pages that explain CWAP and CWDP. For obvious reasons, those can't, aren't complete at the moment because we don't have all, uh, we don't have a study guide done yet. And we don't have a class done. So, um, uh, but you will see the exam objectives for both of those exams. So you'll be able to very easily see what you'll be tested on when you go to earn your CWAP or CWDP certification. So that, that sums up how to earn your CWNE. Um, There is one other change, and that's how to keep your CWNE certification. And it's very clear, very simple. We've toyed with this for since 2007 when we pushed out the CWNE certification, whether it should be um, a a continuing education requirement or some sort of content creation like a book or a white paper. And uh, we, we couldn't please anybody all the time, much less please everybody all the time with any of those Requirement. So the requirement is going to be very simple. Once you earn your CWNE or have your CWNE, you need to pass one of the qualifying exams every three years. So if you have your CWNE like Keith does, then sometime next year he will have to pass either CWNA, CWSP, CWAP, or CWDP in order to keep his CWNE certification. So and again, we hope that I'm gathering those those exams. Uh, Historically, every three, four years have been updated anyway. So if you're anticipating they'll be taking the latest exam. That's correct. It, I, it would, I would hope, yeah. Yeah. It, it, most people have taken more than a couple of years to, to get from the bottom to the top as far as going CWNA to CWNE. So by the time you get to CWNE, you know, you're not going to go right out to take your another exam. Um, and then so you'll have now have three years to to recertify. And by the time you get to that second or third year, you're ready to recertify. Uh, all of those exams will have been updated. 
and and you just have to take any one of them to recertify. That's pretty simple and kind of fair. Uh, I would I would think that I would actually have to study. I think to take the new CWNA again. It's it's, it's been <laughs> yeah. a long time since I took the original one. That's right, and and since, just like CWAP, it's it's been refreshed to uh, reflect the new standards, specifically 802.11n, 802.11e, and uh, and of course the the new Wi-Fi uh, Wi-Fi Alliance standards as well. So and same with um, with CWAP as uh, it was uh, there was a good chunk of that content that didn't change from even six years ago, but uh, a huge chunk was as you know has to be completely redone for for the 802.11n amendment and then of course uh, 802.11e or QoS is a huge part of that. So that's been the base to refresh, and there'll be more things to come as we all know. This the Wi-Fi standards keep changing and keep growing and keep getting better. Okay, so you've you've covered uh, a little review of uh, you know the new website and the tools that are available there, and the new design of the CWNE logo, the changes in CWNE exam, uh, changing September thirtieth with the new AP and DP, and then how to keep the CWNE cert current by taking an exam every three years. Uh, anything else you want to announce for t- tell us about uh, the CWNP program in twenty ten? I don't. Those are all the big announcements. Uh, we're hard at work on, on creating lots of new content and making our website more user friendly and creating a good sense of community there on our website as we seek to, uh, to drive people there to learn. That's what we're all about is making sure everybody, um, who is challenged with managing or implementing or securing or troubleshooting Wi-Fi networks can get the tools and the information they need from CWMP to learn and do their jobs better. And you're doing a great job of it. The new, uh, just a side question, the new color scheme on the on the new website. What's up with that? I mean, you used to be like a red state, now you're a blue state. What was up? Well, the good thing is we we now have the ability to make that change on the fly. So we are blue for the moment. If you were uh, happened to check our website on St. Patrick's Day, uh, you would find a pleasant shade of emerald green where the blue was. And so we'll be able to surprise folks every now and then, and uh, maybe throw up some different colors depending on the day of celebration. I like it. Good idea. Well, thanks for your time again, uh, Kevin. You gave us some new information about the program, and the best of luck to the CDMP program as it uh, continues forward in the future. You're kind of the, the beacon and lighthouse there for a lot of us who, are, who, who want to move forward with this as an industry. So thank you. Thank you, Keith. We appreciate what you're doing with uh, Wireless Land Pros as well. We're looking forward to more content there. All right. Thanks. Bye. Thank you. Interesting facts, little-known tidbits, things you might not have known. Short little bits to set your mind a-reeling. This is Justin Lucas Savage at CoachRadio.tv. You know, the interesting thing is that a lot of businesses, the majority of them, fail within the first five years. If you're going to start an average business, now is a horrible time to do that. But if you're going to start a good business, one that helps people, now is a great time. Elevator speech. Our guests have just two minutes to tell us all about their product or service offering. Ready, set, go. Hey, everybody. This is Cliff Ravenscraft from over at gspn.tv and podcastanswerman.com. I want to tell you that if you have not yet started your own podcast or blogging or getting out there in the new media world, you are missing a huge opportunity. I'm a type of individual that I never really saw the value in this building a community in the new media space. I thought Twitter, Facebook, who's got time for that? Well, I'm somebody who used to be an insurance agent. Uh, About two years ago, I left a career in insurance. I was making about $90,000 a year and I was working in that field for 11 years. And what happened was I found podcasting and new media and found a way to build a community where I could actually kind of talk about the things that were most passionate uh, for me and things that I love to do. And I found an entire world of people out there who were interested in the same things that I was. So much so that I decided to leave my career in insurance and now pursue my passions full time. And literally, I, I have a community of about 50,000 people out there that actually listen to me talk about things that I love. And I found a way to make it all work to where I could do this full time. I'd love to tell you all about my story. You can even uh, find out a little bit of it as you listen uh, episode by episode to podcastanswerman.com and uh, also have more than 2,000 episodes you can listen to over at gspn.tv. 
Things every wireless LAN professional needs to know. Gear up, buckle down, and stand by for the real techie stuff. Welcome back. This is Keith Parsons with Wireless LAN Weekly. And we have uh, Jennifer Huber back with us. Uh, she was on a previous episode, episode nine, talking about her experience with the wireless CCIE. And uh, we got lots of great feedback. And so we're having her back talk to us today. And today we're going to be talking about location tracking systems. Jennifer, how are you doing? I'm doing good. How are you? Great. Uh, where are you today? I'm actually in Austin, Texas Oh, right now. That's good. Home, not on the road, huh? No, not on the road. Well, I'm, so you get to sleep in your own bed tonight. That's, uh, that's always a nice extra feature. That is true. Well, let's talk a little bit about uh, location tracking systems. You have uh, a lot of experience there. Um, so if you were going to be designing a brand new wireless LAN for location tracking compared to a, just a data only system, uh, what kind of differences do you need to think about before you in that process of adding location tracking on top of just data alone? Well, you kind of go down the same path that you would for planning for a voice deployment where you want your power output on your access points to match the power output on the client device, which means that your AP is generally be operating around the 30 milliwatt level because your average client device is right around 30 milliwatts and you want the two of them to match so that they can hear one another. So when the AP talks, the client can hear it and vice versa. Um, but when you think about doing a location deployment, you want to think about putting access points at the perimeter of the building and not just down a long hallway per se. Cisco recommends that you put your APs in equilateral triangular deployment patterns, which we all know is not always possible because buildings have atriums or hard ceilings and areas maybe where you can't get to. But that's the general idea is to have your power output low and have your APs deployed in a fashion so that no matter where the client is in the building, it can be heard, quote unquote, heard by at least three access points at a signal strength of about neg 75 dB. Well, if you have neg 75 dB from three, the, the, I'm assuming the other side of that is you don't want at four, five, and six. Uh, if you can also hear those, then you're having a contention domain where two APs are above 75, and thus they can each of the APs can see each other. Exactly, and it's it's tricky because voice clients, you know, they uh, the cell perimeter is supposed to be neg 65, so neg 75 is you know bigger RF footprint than than that yet. So it, it is very tricky, and it, I think that the key is once you deploy it with a, a good pattern and your signal to noise ratio is good, and you have a low low noise floor, then you have to calibrate. So the the default RF characteristics that the system is assuming uh, can be replaced with the actual RF characteristics that are obtained through calibration. Okay, and what's the process of doing that calibration bit? I remember reading you, you were up late, late one night doing calibration a little, little while ago. Very late. Yes, I was calibrating for an active RFID deployment with AeroScout tags. And they're active tags because they beacon on an 802.11 network frequency. So they are also have a low-level antenna inside them so that they can be triggered by an exciter at doorway entry exit. And the calibration process for that was supposed to be easier than calibrating for client devices with the Cisco WCS system. But I didn't have wireless access to the internal network at the facility yet. Um, so my my station where I was initializing all of my uh, calibration kickoffs was probably a good half mile from the furthest distance that I had to go put the tripod with the tags on it and calibrate. So I was doing a lot of running back and forth, and it was about five hours nonstop of walking as fast as I could. You need a pedometer. I did. You know, I brought my running shoes, but I didn't take the little Nike iPod thing off and put it on my regular work shoes. I should have because it was, I figure at the bare minimum, I did about 15 miles of walking, just minimum. Yeah, in five hours, that's a lot of walking. Yes. So the next day I had access to the internal wireless network and it suddenly got much easier. <laughs> but uh, the idea with uh, calibrating with active RFID tags is you want to configure the tags to beacon at one second interval so that they basically are beaconing constantly. And then you use the AeroScout um the application is actually called System Manager because you're actually tapping into what Cisco calls the partner engine on the MSE, the Mobility Services Engine, and you're calibrating that half of the brain of the MSE for tag positioning, the RFID tag positioning. Now, if you calibrate uh, a Cisco wireless deployment for 802.11 devices, you're going to use the Cisco WCS interface 
to calibrate the other side of the MSE's brain for Wi-Fi clients location accuracy. So what was that? What was the name again? It wasn't third party. You had it, you gave it a different name. Uh, the Aeroscout system manager is the name of the application that you use to interface with that partner engine that's by default now on the Cisco MSE that it ships with. Partner engine. Okay, good. That's what they call it, quote unquote, partner engine. They always refer to it in this really generic term in their documentation. They're referring to the Aeroscout partner engine that's present in the MSE for tag tracking and positioning. Well, you've talked about the MSC a little bit. Explain to us what that is and, and actually physically what is it and what's its purpose in the network. The mobility services engine is the, the next generation from what was called the location appliance. The model was the 2700. And it's just your standard 1U rack mount piece of hardware that's like the same form factor as a controller. Um, there's two different versions of the mobility services engine. One's a 3310 and the other's a 3350. The lower model number obviously supports less clients than the other one does. Cisco's got a great website with all of the documentation about the specs um, on how many clients each one can track, how many tags each one can track, or how many clients each one can track. And then you have to go down the whole path of licensing it appropriately. You have to have licensing, you know, if you want to track Wi-Fi clients, you have to have licensing if you want to track RFID tags, and it's kind of complicated to put a build of materials together. But the mobility services engine, let me get back to your original question, is the device that basically offloads the computations of all of your XY coordinates from uh, your wireless clients or your tagged devices out of the controller. Uh, the messages are brought up through the access points into the controller, and all of that information is um, taken through WCS because you can figure WCS to send uh, the information to the MSE. And once you get everything synchronized, basically it just is where all of your location data is stored and archived and you can configure it to be pruned. You only want to keep, you know, two weeks or a month or what have you, but that's where all of your location data is stored, your historical location data for either Wi-Fi clients or RFID tagged assets. Okay. So you want to walk through a, the actual data, the packet flow from, a RFID tag that's uh, 802.11 listening. It's sitting someplace. What does it do to get from that point all the way back to you know where its actual location? Uh, what it does is, is you configure the tag to beacon at an X interval. You can configure it to beacon more when it's in motion. And basically what it's doing when it's beaconing is it's sending out its MAC address along with its battery life status in an 802.11 wireless packet that's heard by the access point. Sorry to interrupt. Is it a data frame or is it a special 802.11 type frame? I, um, you know, I'm not entirely sure because a lot of the documentation that I've seen from Aeroscout doesn't get down into that nitty gritty level. But I, I could certainly look it up and we can put it in the show notes if I find it, you know. Okay, so the tag sends out a beacon, some of, of not an actual 802.11 beacon, but it sends out a beaconing piece of packet. The APs pick it up. I'm assuming multiple APs would pick it up. Multiple APs would pick it up, and you also configure the the tag to beacon. It, it can be configured to just beacon on one channel, which you know wouldn't be terribly useful. So you have to configure the tag to beacon on one six and eleven, so that it can be heard by you know any neighboring AP channel. Um, and then that information is taken into the MSC, and you can either interface into the system to see where your devices are, either through WCS which also has to be licensed to support the MSE. But um, you can use Mobile View, which is the Aeroscout application. That um, There's actually some videos about uh, the Aeroscout Mobile View application on YouTube um, that show how the application can be used on Cisco phones to track wheelchairs in hospitals. Um, there's a, a web interface that you could customize for end users so that they only see, say, their nurse's station so that they don't have to see the entire solution as you would if you logged into WCS. WCS is a little bit much for your average end user. And the, the um, mobile view is is much more user friendly and highly customizable. It has a lot of the logic, you know, already built in. Say, if my tag comes through this area that I've defined as zone X and it doesn't leave that area, you know, after 15 minutes, send me an email because I want to know that that tag is dwelling in that area longer than it's supposed to say it's like a, a parts workflow process and say that the carburetor is, you know, it's not supposed to be on the, on the, the, um, the conveyor belt for, you know, more than however many X time you can, all of that logic is already built in. So you just basically take 
an if then statement and fill in the different variables. If this tag does this, then do this. So all of that's done for you. If you just use WCS, then all of that logic isn't there. And it's much more manual to get that same kind of information out of it. So to recap, the tag sends out its information. The APs pick it up. The APs tunnel it back to the controller. The controller sends it to WCS. WCS interfaces with MSC. And MSC does all of the math to figure out where it is. And then you yes. could use a uh, mobile view and it queries into the MSC database. Is that where it gets its information from? Yes. Mobile view taps into the quote unquote partner engine that's in the MSC for the tag positioning. It can also display Wi-Fi clients. Um, and just like, you know, the WCS can display RFID tags. It just depends upon what your end user facing view should be like or what exactly you want to do with the information of the location of your assets. Okay, we got a pretty general view there. Uh, on back to a design question I was thinking of. You'd mentioned putting these little triads of APs and starting from the outside in. Have you ever done any um, quantitative analysis of comparing a uh, data network number of APs for coverage compared to a location network that, for coverage with the additional requirements that location needs? But how many more APs do you do you see that you need in that process? I don't have an exact number. I can, I am not afraid to say that I don't know. I can definitely look it up. Um, but I knew, I, I do know that data networks that I've seen tend to be operating at full power with high gain antennas so that the customer can get the biggest bang for their buck for their money that they paid for these access points. They want to ring every single last bit of the RF they can get out of them. So in a situation like that, there would be a big difference between a full powered high gain antenna data deployment and, and a location tracking deployment. But I can certainly try and find some specs on that, see if there's a general rule of thumb or a percentage that the difference is. OK, I, I've seen anywhere from, you know, 30, 40 percent more uh, down to maybe only 20 percent more if you already had voice or double or right. all sorts. There's been a lot of numbers. I just kind of seeing what you saw. That, that's, that sounds about right. Yeah. Compared to voice deployment, uh, is there there's a percentage more as well to add the little triads plus the outsides? There is, and sometimes you can deploy. Uh, say, if you got a greenfield deployment for a voice network, you can be mindful of location tracking when you're choosing your locations to put your APs to support voice. So it may not be a full blown. 100% ready for location tracking, wireless deployment, but you positioned your APs in such a way that it will help be more accurate. Well, that's good to know. If you're running voice and location tracking simultaneously, voice likes to see, as you mentioned, a NEG65, and the location devices need about a NEG75, so you're going to have different size circles depending on what the devices are. How do you manage that, that difference between the two? Well, I would say that the, the the hotter the signal that your clients can be seen at, uh, that the closer they are to the APs and the more lo uh, more accurately your location triangulation is going to be. Because uh, if you have that good of a signal strength for a client device to be heard at, say, NEG65, that's a much tighter uh, distance from the actual access point than a NEG75 would be. So I would think that your location would be even better if your clients are being heard at NEG65. Uh, another question for you. Sorry, just be dumping on you. Um, and another question that I've come across on location tracking is that those devices have fixed battery life. And one of the issues that some of my clients are a little worried that, you know, how long those batteries last and they're, they're a pain to try to track down. Well, they say that the battery can last up to four years, but I've seen that the AeroScout application has a little built-in lifetime calculator. If you tell it, you know, I want the tag to beacon, say, every 30 seconds or every minute, and when it's, you know, in motion, I want it to beacon this, this much, and it will tell you approximately what your battery life expectancy is going to be. But you have to keep in mind that with every tag beacon, you get the battery level so that you can generate a report saying what your what batteries are fixing to die and those tags actually are field replaceable you can replace the batteries in them it's not complicated to, to open up the back and the actually the t2 tags you can get replacement batteries for them at batteries plus the t3 tags have a bit of a different battery it's kind of like i think i heard it was like one eighth of a d cell battery so it's a little skinny slice of a d cell battery and i think you'd have to order those probably and have some on hand but you are getting the information that you know when you know when they're going out. So. Oh yeah, you're getting the information. Mm -hmm. the, the next issue a lot of people talk about with location tracking is resolution. You know, is it down to one meter, two meters, ten meters, and depending on uh, 
what you're after. You're trying to find an infusion pump in a hospital. That's one type of resolution. The other is if you're in like a big open, uh, you know, a retail store, like a Walmart or something, trying to find which aisle you're on. Uh, those are two entirely different RF environments. Uh, what kind of resolution have you seen getting in the systems you've installed? Well, the, the rule of thumb, according to Cisco, is within, I believe it's nine meters or within 10 meters, 90 percent of the time. And that's a pretty big range. Uh, if you want to have what do they call it? Bin level accuracy. You would have exciters at maybe the uh, at the beginnings of the aisles in order to have it. If we're talking active tags here. Um, so that the active tags, you, you could be more specific about its exact location because whenever a tag is triggered by an exciter or a choke point, as Cisco WSCS calls it, then you know exactly where on the floor plan, what XY coordinate that tag has passed through. But uh, a lot of your RFID technology that's out there that's widely distributed, say in Walmarts and whatnot, is a passive RFID tag. And that, uh, from what I've seen, I've seen... Um, I've seen instances where there's been deployments in laboratories, you know, they have laboratory animals and each little uh, cage that the laboratory animal is in has a passive RFID tag on the outside of it. And they do inventory by sweeping the, a low level exciter down the rows of the laboratory animals so that they know what their inventory is. And that's, that's using the exciter side, but from a it is. 8 or 11 side. Yeah, yeah, but the passive tags aren't 802.11. The active tags are the only ones that, that actually integrate with a, a Wi-Fi network. So what kind of resolution you've been getting in? Uh, you mentioned you were just in a hospital. Uh, actually, it was a retail store that I was in. Oh. And I, I, in my opinion, I don't think that they had quite enough access points to get the kind of accuracy that they were hoping for. But I kind of had to deal with the situation as it was because I couldn't make any changes to their network. I just kind of had to go in and calibrate to my best effort. Um, so optimally, when you go into calibrate, you're supposed to turn off or, or, or basically turn off RRM so that your APs aren't changing power levels while you're doing the calibration. You're supposed to do a few other things, but I didn't have that luxury. So the accuracy that I got was less than optimal. In my opinion, there were some areas that were surprisingly better than I thought they were going to be. And it was interesting because the output from the, the AeroScout application said that my location accuracy was just going to be awful. And that's kind of what I thought, too. So when I went in and kind of presented this data to the customer saying, I think that you need more access points, they're like, whoa, whoa, hang on, hang on. We had the same number of APs at a different site that we had calibrated and everything was fine there. I'm like, OK, well, let me take some tags, hang them out in the store, see what we get. Uh, and when I did that, I was surprised that the tags were pretty much where I put them. I put 16 tags throughout the store and I was hanging them on the shelving because I wasn't at the stage of the project where I could ask employees to wear the tags because um, the project wasn't quite that far along yet. So I just kind of hung them down the aisles on, on the metal shelving. And that's not optimal either because if the idea is that you're tracking moving assets, they're not going to be right up against the metal shelving. So the tags that reported where they weren't really hanging were basically an aisle over. And I didn't think that that was too bad because the depth of a, of an aisle in this retail establishment is maybe 20, 15 feet, something like that. Really big, deep. So I didn't think it was that bad to be off by, you know, 15 or so feet. So that's sub five meters. That's, that's a lot better than the Cisco anticipation. Yeah. And, and that's, you know, with not, there was one corner that had a, a dead spot for voice calls because it, it probably needed an extra access point. But, uh, even the, even the data that from the client calibration in WCS said that the location was just going to be terrible. But that's not really what I found when I went and put stuff out into the store and, and said, well, where does it think that it is? So I, I kind of have competing information there, and I'm not really sure. I haven't really um, dug through my data and tried to piece it together and figure out, well, why, does, why, why, why was the WCS and the Aeroscat applications telling me it was going to be awful when that's not what I saw when I actually distributed clients or RFID tags? It was kind of odd. It's also a good odd. Yeah. yeah I mean, there's it bad odds and there's a good odd. I couldn't really explain why the real implementation or the real testing with the devices looked a lot different than what the, the location accuracy was being predicted through the tools that I was using. Uh, did you try uh, just trying to track down uh, your laptop as well? So n not a tag, but a, just a Wi-Fi device. 
Yeah, there were some Wi-Fi devices that were already in use at the store. And I did. I went and looked at the map and said, OK, there's one in, you know, aisle 15 and one in aisle 34. It's kind of halfway down the aisle. Let me go see. Is it there? And it was it was pretty close. It was pretty close. So. Well, good. Well, I, I appreciate your time today talking to us a little bit about location tracking and, uh, and your experience. Uh, a couple of weeks ago, we talked about the your CCA wireless. Was there any of the MSE uh, information on the CCA wireless? There's not the MSE, but you have to know about the older version of that, the 2700 location appliance. And the command line's a wee bit different, um, but the idea is about the same. Um, y- yeah, you have to be familiar with uh, how you configure it from the wizard perspective. Um, there's a few things that you need to know, but the, the ideas are the same behind the, the location tracking and, uh, and the location appliance and the MSE. The MSE has just um, got more horsepower to it. It's, it has the ability to do uh, a few different feature sets that the location appliance didn't. And, and like I said, we can link to the, to the documentation on Cisco's website about the MSE or people will be, you know, more than able to, to find it if okay. they're curious. I like that. Uh, one last question here. Uh, antennas. Uh, a, a lot of us have been designing wireless networks for a long time and there's, you know, basically three things you can do to change. You can change the number of APs, the size of the circles with power and the shape of the coverage pattern with antennas um, in your experience. Have you had any uh, experience with changing antennas with the MSE or do you have to stay with the uh, omnidirectionals? Well, there was some discussion that we had uh, me and my coworker, Sam Clements. He's also part of the NetPro forum. He's a top level user because he's always chiming in with his two cents because that's his nature. Um, he's also on Twitter, but he doesn't Twitter much. Uh, he actually had a long discussion with somebody that worked for Cisco, whose name escapes me at this moment, and asked the question, if you're focusing the beam width of the antenna and changing basically the the from a 360, say, to a 180 or something like that, so that there's less of a back lobe, um, that it, isn't that going to affect your location accuracy because of the way that the algorithm is designed? It's, it's assuming, you know, a 360-degree antenna pattern with three access points hearing the device, and there's some math in there that I totally don't understand <laughs> that, that tells you, okay, well, your X, Y is going to be approximately here when you, you do the triangulation. Um, if your antenna beam width is, is not a 360 and say that one access point that's got a directional antenna on it doesn't hear the client as well as the other two neighboring access points that have a, an omnidirectional antenna on it, isn't that going to change your location accuracy? And the answer was yes, that it was. And there were going to be changes made to their documentation to encourage the use of omnidirectional antennas for that reason. Because if your client device that you're trying to track is on the back side of a directional antenna where the back lobe is, that's also going to affect your RRM because your neighboring antenna and your neighboring access points aren't going to hear that signal coming out of the directional antenna on the back lobe or side lobe as well as they would in front of it. So you have the possibility of the directional antennas also wanting to make the system initialize a, a power level change or, uh, or or something like that. So, and I hadn't really thought about that, but now I read the conversation that the two of them had back and forth and it, it does make sense. And that's that's why I wrote the, uh, the little blog post about sectorized antennas versus omnidirectional antennas and how does a, a sectorized antenna system do location tracking if there's not a central brain taking all of those little pizza slices sectors and, and thinking about them in, in a 360 degree fashion. So maybe that's why we haven't seen a lot of Xerus location tracking. I, I would love to see how that works. I still can't get my head around it unless they tell me that there's some sort of brain that can take all of those pizza slices and understand that if a, a, a client device is heard at three o'clock on the pie, you know, that it can correlate all of that information and actually provide a location out of that. Because otherwise, the nine o'clock sector doesn't hear the three o'clock sector. And how in the heck? I, I still I can't wrap my head around it. it, it I mean, I, I, I can see the math behind it. If you had enough of those zeros arrays were all together and you saw one sees it at two o'clock, the other sees it at 10 o'clock. And if you know where they are, you could, you know, get you a much closer location. But you're right. You need some centralized piece that pulls it all together. Yeah. Uh, well, oh, I said it was one last question. This one isn't a question. This is just a reiteration. You had mentioned uh, turning off RRM during calibration. Yeah. I'm assuming the way you said that, that you need to turn it back on when you're done. 
Yeah, well, yeah, yeah, of course. But the idea is to have the wireless network be stable and not change while you're trying to do your calibration. It'd be like trying to catch a moving target. Because if it's making a change to your power output on your access points while you're calibrating, well, then that's changing the RF footprint. That's the change in the, the way the client's going to be heard. If it changes the channel while you're calibrating, it's possible that you could lose some information there while you're calibrating. So what I was doing was not optimal. I learned a lot from it because it was such a big deployment. It was really cool to be able to go do something like that and and and, and kind of run with it with just some uh, email support from Aeroscout. That was cool because nobody that had to come there and hold my hand. So I was able to go do what I could do without changing the network at all. And, and I learned a lot and it was really cool. I liked it. Just to follow up on that, if you turn RM back on post calibration, doesn't that run the risk of changing the channels and changing the power? And wouldn't that mess up your calibration? Yes. What, what you could do if, if you know your wireless network better than the controller knows your wireless network, which is possible, especially if you're using directional antennas, you, you may have uh, everything set and say like a, an LWAP or a CAPWAP power output level of uh, say three is, is right around the, the, the 30 milliwatt client level. In this network, I saw the access points were pretty much at power level one and two, which wasn't so great. But like I said, I couldn't change it. So it, I thought it was running a little too hot, which told me that there weren't enough access points. Oh, okay. I, I was just worried that if you turned RM back on, no, it, you, you, the calibration gets shot. You have to go recalibrate again. Yeah. And there was something interesting that I read in the uh, the location, location-based location design guide, the 4.1, I think is the newest one that they have it's from 2008. And this is a Cisco guide. There's one paragraph jumped out at me and I thought it was pretty crazy. They said that an active logistics shipping and receiving area can have the accuracy degrade of up to 20% within a 30-day period. So say you calibrate it, you can calibrate it day one. You can expect after 30, 30 days that your accuracy is thrown off 20%. And they recommended a complete recalibration every six months, which I thought was pretty insane to do all of that work every six months. Well, you know, if that 20% is off every month, yeah, yeah. I can see why you usually yeah. come back. <laughs> yeah, if it was just one, one, one 20%, you could probably live with. But if it continues to degrade, that makes it pretty tough. Yeah, pretty, that was a pretty crazy statistic that jumped out at me while I was reading that, that design guide. Okay, it's two years old. Maybe they got it fixed now. Maybe. One one can only hope. Uh, well, thanks for your time today, Jennifer. Uh, if you uh, send on the links, we'll add them to the show notes. So there's uh, places people can go and, and learn a little bit more, both about uh, the Cisco location system with MSE and through that design guide, as well as AeroScout's little bit. And uh, appreciate your time. Not a problem. All right, thanks. Thank you. Well, that about wraps up episode number 13 of Wireless Land Weekly. We're glad you've been with us. Uh, many of you have been with us ever since the first episode a couple months ago. Uh, this has turned into quite an endeavor, and we enjoy bringing you uh, weekly information about the Wireless Land professionals that are out there. If you have any questions or feedback, feel free to do that at the Wireless Land Weekly podcast out on wirelesslandprofessionals.com. Thanks for joining us again. We'll see you next week. Wireless Land Weekly, a podcast focused on the needs of wireless land professionals. We look forward to your feedback. Please leave your comments at the bottom of the show notes or email feedback on the show can be sent to feedback at wirelesslandprofessionals.com. If you'd like to leave a voicemail feedback, just call 24-7 and leave a message at 1-801-481-9018. Until next time, this has been another production of wirelesslandprofessionals.com, a place to educate, inform, entertain, and inspire.